Merci. Hello, and welcome to For Better or For Work. This is the show that explores what it's like to work together as a couple. My name is Gary Hirschberg. And I'm Meg Hirschberg. I joined Gary at Stonyfield Farm in 1986 and started working for the company right away. Today, we're here to listen to and react to Danny Eaney and Bumi Patak's conversation, Should We Work Together? But first, Gary, do you remember that I met Danny when he wrote to me asking if he could use the title of my book as the title of this podcast? I didn't recall that, but did you ever think at that time that you and I would actually be guest hosts on that very same podcast? Nope, but here we are. Well, let's hear what Danny and Boomy have to say. So the topic on the table is, should we work together? For people who are listening to this show, who are interested in exploring the dynamic of working as an entrepreneur with your significant other, the first question is, I mean, going chronologically, depending on when people are listening to this, you know, maybe it's too late. But in theory, the first question is, should we even do this? Should we work together? So how should we approach this? Should we start with like our story or like, how do you want to do this? Yeah, I was thinking about this. It's been nine years since we've been working together. That's crazy. (laughs) But I was thinking about when we were first, you know, thinking about it or talking about it. And even before that, like before I joined Mercy, I was working at a consulting company. And as I was getting ready to kind of share the news and as I shared the news with people that I was working with, there was a lot of sort of like, oh, wow, you got to work with your husband at the time or, you know, that's going to be really awesome. And I didn't get that because I don't think I, again, I don't know how it was for you, but like for me, the attraction wasn't that you and I get to work together. It was more that Danny was working on this interesting project because it wasn't a full-fledged business yet. Hang on, that's not fair. It was. How are we defining full-fledged business? Okay. I mean, yes, it was a full-fledged... You were, you were like, person, you were team member seven. There were, there were other seven. people. I was, like there was I was number four. No, no. I mean, there was Megan, Amanda, uh, Robin, Christina, Steph, all before you. Oh, right. But we hired Christina and Steph and someone else like right before I joined. So anyway, when you made the offer, I think when you and I were talking, I was more like team number four. But whatever, who's counting? Well, if you, if you had moved faster on the offer, you would have been employee number four. But what can I say? You dragged your feet. All right. Fair enough. It was very much a startup. It was like a ragtag team. It was, it was messy, to say the least. So yes, I'll grant you that. That's fine. Our story was more like I was looking to make a change. There was this opportunity that, you know, you had created in terms of the team and all that stuff. And so we explored whether it'd be a good idea for us to work together. There is often when people are like, should we work together? The number one reason is there's too much to do and the significant other represents an available pair of hands that are going to be cheap or free, or at least perceived as such. And that wasn't the core driver for us. You know, it was a consideration in the sense that we were not in a position to pay your market value at the time. And we, we meaning you and I together, we made a very intentional choice that you were on board with, correct me if I'm wrong, that you were taking a pay cut in the short term because you wanted to earn in some equity, some actual ownership of the business. So that was a component. You were more senior and talented of a person than we could afford to hire at that time in another way. And there was a match between, at, at least on the surface, between your skills and experience and training and the stage of business that we were at. So for context, for everyone who's listening, we were kind of doing about half a million dollars a year in revenue at the time. And I'd always managed all the numbers myself off of Excel and in my head. And I was good at it. I could do that. I always knew what the numbers were, give or take 10%. But we were starting to get to a scale where give or take 10% was kind of like not nothing anymore. And we needed some more adult supervision and management on that side of the business. And so Boomi's expertise came in with a lot of value. Now, now it also brought with it, because, you know, culturally speaking, referring to corporate culture, like there was a huge culture shock for you coming into a startup. You're used to working with, you know, big companies and consulting firms. And, you know, we're this ragtag little startup. So very, very different. And there was a a ramp up and learning curve for your expertise to bring its full value. Let me ask you something. I mean, this is something that came up for me and I, I don't think we ever talked about it. You weren't, I mean... The opportunity came up. You knew me, obviously, we knew each other. And so we came to an arrangement which would have been affordable for the business and 
all that stuff. And I could see sort of like, yeah, you know, I could, I could help with sort of the finance. So for those of you who don't know, my background is in accounting, financial management, and consulting and project management. But you would not have put out a job ad that I would have replied to, that I would have qualified for. No, I wouldn't have. Yeah. So it's not like you were looking for someone with my skill set at the time. Like it wasn't that obvious a match. No, I was looking for you. It was you that I wanted. (laughs) What was the thinking there? So for me, you know, as I mentioned, like it wasn't so much the attraction wasn't so much that I would get to work with you and we'd get to spend all this time together. It was more, this is an interesting project. That's flattering to hear again and again, by the way, if you want to say it a few more times. (laughs) But no, no, I get it. But so, okay, look. So from your perspective, you had done, you know, a bunch of years in corporate, a bunch of years in consulting, and you were, you know, you you were kind of done. You were ready to move on. You were, you know, you'd learned what you were there to learn. I I, I actually, to be fair, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do next. Right. Anyway, so there was an opportunity for me to kind of, you know, work part-time at the consulting firm, keep sort of like the high salary and the benefits and all that stuff. And then also, you know, help out with the business at that point. And I was like, Danny, I'm really, I came home and I was really excited. It's like, I think we've got this. This is going to be so much better. I talked to my partner and when I talked to her, she's, you know, obviously she understood where I was coming from. She wanted to be supportive. And she was like, well, what about this? I think, you know, that way it's like the best of both worlds. I'm like, yeah, that would be the best of both worlds. Let me talk to Danny about it. But you didn't agree with that. You didn't, you know, you were, I don't know. I was surprised that you didn't agree with this arrangement. And two, I was also Surprised at how like, you know, bold you were and like you just expected me to kind of like say no to that offer and join you full time. And you, I mean, okay, do you want to kind of share the story a little bit? Because I think that was interesting. I mean, look, I've always been biased towards people working full time. Our industry is like riddled with, you know, five hours a week, 10 hours a week, like all these arrangements. I've never been in favor of that. I've never done that. We've always hired people full time or the majority of full time. And my bias has always been that part of someone's time buys you a lot less than that part of their attention. And if someone's coming in to like punch a clock, do some tasks, you know, you can kind of sort of get that to work on part time. If you're feeling someone to really buy in and take on the leadership, I mean, look, you've been in the company for nine years. Do you think part time would have worked? Oh, no, I think it was the right call. It's just at the time, I mean, now looking back, obviously hindsight, you know, 2020 and all that, it looks like it was the right call. But you were actually prepared to kind of be like, okay, no, I guess this is not going to work then. If you want to do part-time, then this is not the place for you. Like, that's essentially what you told me. And so I was like surprised it was such a non-negotiable for you. Well, I mean, I've never read the book, but I keep hearing people quote this line from Eat, Pray, Love about, I think it's about having a baby, that it's like getting a tattoo on your face. You've got to be fully committed, right? Working at a startup is kind of like that too. You've got to be all in, right? And we're not talking about you coming in being like a part-time secretary or intern or something like that. Like, you know, the idea was if you to be involved in a very senior capacity. It's just not something that you can do or that can work on a part-time basis. I mean, we coach a lot of entrepreneurs and we see the friction that it creates when, you know, one party is all in and the other party is like, you know, half in, half out. It creates a huge disparity in terms of what's going in, what the expectations are, et cetera. I just, I don't think that works. And you were also very like, you know, cause you wanted to earn in equity too. And I was like, no, no, you've got to be all in. And, and, you know, there's no equity on the table until you're, you're completely in. You can't do that with like one foot in, one foot out. You know, I knew you could bring a lot of value because I have a ton of respect for you. And it's part of why I, I love you and why I'm happy to be married to you, <laughs> right? I mean, you know, you're a beautiful woman, but you're a lot more than the pretty face. So there's a lot of substance there. Aww. And so, well, no, I mean, you, you know, I think that that's not, that's not news. Um, but so there was a lot of fit there for sure. But the thing that was a big precipitator of this opportunity, as I recall, is that we were having uh, more and more friction around business decisions, right? You know, the business is growing and growing a business means investments. It means risks. And there were, I'm a very like, look, look what I did at school today. I I was that kind of kid, right? So I like to talk about my work and I like to share. And that would provoke a lot of reactions of, wait a minute, you're doing what? You're spending how much money on what thing? And it was frustrating because you didn't really have the context. Yeah, you're right. But I want to give an example of this. So Danny and I would just, you know, went out for a walk after work or what have you, right? And he's like, okay, so we're getting ready for this launch and we need to hire one person. We need to hire a coach because I think we'll need the coach trained up so that they can support our students. So then he, you put out a job ad, you got a bunch of applicants, you were interviewing people. So I think a week later or whatever, we're going out on another walk. And he's like, so I think I'm going to hire three people actually, because I think you know, it'd be good to have more than one person just in case we exceed capacity. That way, you know, we get to kind of see like 
who is performing, how they're performing. They have each other to kind of support each other. And so these are the kind of decisions and conversations we're having. So I'm like, wait a second. Okay, you want to hire one person? Okay, I get that. You know, you're gearing for lunch. But you're going to hire three people? Like what? In, like in a span of a week or two, you kind of change your mind about like, and it's like, what do you mean you need three people? What is the capacity that you need? So it's like all these questions that come up for me. And so those were the kind of conversations we were having. I mean, look, managing a startup, managing a business and growing a business involves seeing opportunities. When you see an opportunity in front of you, you jump on it, you seize it, right? And, you know, similarly, when, whether it's investing in training or in working with this or that consultant or flying to a mastermind or stuff like that, they tend to involve price tags that are not insignificant, especially as the business is growing. And they become harder and harder to relate to when you're outside the business. And so just anyway, long story short, it was creating a lot of friction. And, you know, where I would kind of land at the end of this is like, look, you're not in the meeting. You don't get to have an opinion, right? Not in a, I don't value your perspective, but just you don't, you're not informed enough for your perspective to be valuable. And so, you know, my position was, if you want to have a voice in this, if you want to have a vote, then come and be a part of the company and let's do this. And I think it really worked out well, not that we had less disagreements, but the disagreements became more material and more relevant and your input was valuable. Right. In a way that it wasn't before you joined the company, not because you didn't have the, the expertise, you just you didn't have enough visibility on the scope of things. Yeah, the context was important, right? Because once I started being part of the team, I knew what the strategy was, or I not just knew, but I understood it much better what the strategy was, where we were going, what the growth uh, opportunities were, what the value might have been, and also like getting to know some of the people and, you know, seeing the impact that we were generating and people were serving and what the the opportunity for getting there. So yeah, that helped with some of those frictions. It created a lot more frictions, which I'm guessing we'll talk about at some point. But yes, being part of the team, working with you certainly helped. I feel like it helped our relationship, but it could not have gone this way, right? It could have gone a different direction too, potentially. And we've seen that happen with people when they choose to work together and it doesn't work out. I mean, it's interesting because like, honestly, I can't imagine not working with you, right? Like when I see couples that don't work together, I'm like, what do they talk about? Like, how do they, how do they have a shared context for, you know, what is going on? Like, how do you navigate that? And, you know, obviously people do, and I'm sure it's fine, but I think it adds such a richer dimension of connection between us. I mean, for me, it was really fun to see you in action. I would watch you present on webinars and I'd watch you lead meetings or coach a client. And I don't know, it was really fun to see you from that perspective, which is not visibly that I had before I started working with you. So yeah, I wanted to add that. Yeah. And likewise, like it's this whole dimension of a person that you don't see. And to be clear, I don't think either of us is advocating that, you know, oh, yes, you should work together because it's good for the marriage. Like, I think it often is and it can be, but I don't think that's the reason to do it. But it was an important part of the decision making and part of what made it attractive. I think if we step away from our story and go to the, you know, how do we advise people who are like, should we work together? We kind of go to a list of criteria. So one criteria is, is there actually meaningful work for them to do as opposed to, yeah, we just need an extra pair of hands that ideally don't cost any money. There's the old trope, the old myth about, you know, don't work with family. It's so bad to work with family or friends for that matter. And I've always thought that's total nonsense. I think it really depends on what it is that you appreciate about someone. You know, if you really like, um, if you really like, you know, going out and bowling and having drinks with someone because they're fun that way and you like the stories they tell, yeah, that's not a good reason for you to work with someone, right? If, you know, you find someone just unbelievably physically attractive, that's great for certain things. It's not a good reason to bring them into the company. But if a big part of what you appreciate about someone is you just have an enormous amount of respect for them, how capable, how competent, how sharp, how on the ball, et cetera, right? If you have that deep respect, then, you know, what better reason could there be to want to work with someone? So, you know, I think double check kind of like, do you think they're good for this role because for the right reasons? Or is it just like, you know, well, there's a warm body and it's really close and they'll probably work for free, right? That's not a good reason to do this. I mean, the warm body argument is fine for short term. You know, it's like, you know, we just have this, you know, busy period we need to get through and maybe the busy period happens every, I don't know, six months or so, you know, can someone help out? I think it's fine as you're growing to do that. And as you're doing it, it could also be a good opportunity to kind of explore what else, how does it feel to work together? Is there a bigger uh contributor value that this person can be adding? Is there a different arrangement that could work for, for, for both? You know, we work with a lot of coaches and consultants and entrepreneurs who are in a context or in a family context where the 
their spouse doesn't understand, you know, the appeal or the attraction of owning a business. Um, and, you know, to be fair, that was the case with me when, before I met Danny. So I come from a family of accountants. We believe in uh, stability and consistency and job security. So someone wanting to start a business, it just, I just did not see, I didn't see the attraction, you know, climbing the corporate ladder was my career trajectory or my career aspiration at that point. And if that's the case, whether because they've always had corporate jobs or they haven't had jobs and they, they don't understand the, the entrepreneurship context, it's helpful to participate in the venture in some way, shape or form. So I just want to say, like, I agree, it's not the same as being part of the business or owning a business. Um, if you're just helping out, but even just helping out gives you a lot more visibility and it'll probably help your relationship versus just not being involved at all uh, in the business. Yeah, I agree with that. I, look, it's not that different from, you know, so you're, people can't tell hearing our voices necessarily, but you're, you're Indian, you're from India, you grew up there. And so at one point, and even though obviously, you know, I mean, your parents are Indian, we eat Indian food and, you know, there's, <laughs> there's all that stuff going on. But at some point in the relationship, you were pregnant with Priya, so I guess seven and a half years ago. We went to India, right? We took a trip because this is part of your heritage and this is part of your culture. And yes, we like to travel and we've gone different places, but this was different. This was not just a let's take a trip somewhere interesting, right? It had historical cultural significance to you and therefore to me, I was interested. So it's a little bit analogous to that. Like helping out with the business is a little bit of like, I want to understand the culture of where you come from professionally. Yeah, no, that's a great analogy. You took a huge pay cut to come work in the company. And then over the course of a few years, your salary was right-sized and then continued to grow based on the value that you were adding. I mean, you're making more today in the company than you probably would have made if you'd stayed in the corporate world. Correct me if you disagree. Not to mention like, you know, the incredible flexibility and all that kind of stuff. I'm not sure. I feel like I stopped tracking that a while. I stopped tracking that a while ago and but like either way, I think it's at the, it really, at the very least it's on par. It would, yeah. I mean, if it's yeah, if it's not on par, then and again, it depends on what's important to you, right? So it's important for me to be compensated according to my value. So if it wasn't on par, then the then again, I don't know that it would have been sustainable. Another important point is that when I decided to join, you know, join you, and I was able to take the pay cut, it was it's because we could afford it, right? We had a tiny condo, no kids at the time. <laughs> And so we had a lot of flexibility in terms of like, you know what, for maybe we can, I could take a pay cut because it's, it has an impact on our family income. So I could take a pay cut and we would be okay. And, you know, if it doesn't work out, I can always go back to my corporate job or consulting or what have you, and I'd be fine. But that said, you know, one of the uh, concerns I had about joining you in the business was the lack of diversification. So It'd be like having all our eggs in one basket. If the business did great, excellent, we would both benefit from it. Our family would be great, would be fine. Um, and would have stability and security. But if the business tanked for some reason, then, you know, both our sort of in earning power is tied to that. And that would not be good, at least for probably a few months. And then we'd figure it out. Yeah. And, and there's a compensatory relationship between, on the one hand, how much can you afford to take the risk? And on the other hand, how much do you believe in the opportunity and really want to do it? And, you know, as long as the balance of those two things feels like it kind of tracks, like, you know, maybe it does feel like a bit of a risk, but I really want to do it. I really believe in it. Whereas, you know, I believe in it, but, you know, not quite as much. But on the other hand, we can afford to take the risk a lot more, like, you know, as long as that balances. Yeah, that makes sense. Exactly. <laughs> And so, you know, just as our kids are growing up and we, you know, sometimes take a step back and we hear them say things and we're like, oh, wow, I can't believe they said that. I can't believe how mature they've become. I can't believe they are our kids. I often rather feel the same way about our business, which is like, oh, look at that. And look at the team and the culture and the impact and the community. And that has been cool. It's not always obvious when you're in the weeds of like, you know, dealing with day-to-day -day stuff, but like taking a step back, just like as in parenting, right? Day to day, you can have a lot of frustrations and issues and things that you're solving for, and also, you know, fun and joy and happiness and all that stuff. But it's really cool to be able to take a step back and look at what we've created and know that this is sort of like our, our baby, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Oh boy, there was so much that I related to. I almost don't know where to begin. I think that one point that they made that was very important among many was that it's important for the, the spouse, if one entrepreneur starts the business versus both starting it together, 
and is joined by the spouse, it's important that the work that the spouse is doing be important to that person. Otherwise, it's kind of a square peg in a round hole, which, as they said, can work for, you know, short term, but not, it's not really a good fit for the long term. And I think that was part of the issue in our situation, which was different, very different, because our business was losing money and it was very much like an all hands on deck situation. And I was not skilled or interested or trained at all to work in sales and eventually to work in the yogurt factory too for a short stint. These things were not, you know, were not up my alley, but I, I did them because I was pitching in. We were on this farm. There weren't a lot of other opportunities for me and uh, my hands were needed, but ultimately it wasn't a fit for me. And I think that was a great point that they made. Yeah, I have to say that engaging your spouse because they are an available pair of hands is a terrible idea. And I loved listening to their back and forth, the, the deep appreciation that they had for each other. And I don't think they may understand how critical that combination probably was to making this work. It wasn't, I think, just that Boomi had knowledge that Danny uh, needed to have in the business, you know, as he said, stepping up professionally. I think there's a level of deep admiration that really made it work. I had that in spades for my bride here. But as Maggie said, this was not a great place for her. Not only were the jobs not what she did or were inclined to do, but something we also have to talk about here is there's a giant difference between us in terms of risk tolerance. I'm a classic entrepreneur, ready, fire, aim guy. Maggie is very scientific, very deliberate, needs to know what's around the corner. How are we going to go there? And the aim is really important before the ready even starts. It was instructive early on, but this was a bad fit. This is a slight digression, but when we would leave this farm, which folks need to hear my podcast on how I built this or read Meg's book to get the whole story. But what you'll hear is sort of nine years of purgatory, right? Of penance. And I mean, of pain, really, before we ever made any money. And when we used to go leave the farm to go visit her mother with central heating and a warm bathtub for Meg and real meals, and we weren't having to make yogurt or share our bathroom with the employees, it was like a honeymoon every time when we were leaving. And on the drive back, we inevitably would have a fight over something. And it took us years to realize this pattern, which is we just didn't want to go back to that as, as a couple. It was just a misfit. The entrepreneurial environment makes an absolutely amazing entrepreneur, but she approaches it completely differently than I do. Yeah, I'm methodical. I'm pretty linear. <laughs> I wouldn't describe Yari that way. <laughs> I mean, the other thing, let's just frame it for everybody. Not only were we not profitable, we were, I always like to say about our early days at Stonyfield that we had a wonderful company, just no supply and no demand. And so it was like everything we were doing was fighting uphill. And so poor Meg, who, you know, un had the misfortune of falling for this crazy entrepreneur moving mm -hmm. up there. Meg, you were a pair of hands and you were so game and it was wonderful. But there was nothing about this business that fit your disposition. But to make matters a little bit more complicated, in fact, a lot more, our largest investor became your mom, Meg's mom. And that is not a piece of advice I recommend to anybody. It meant that when we went to Maggie's house, you know, and we sit around the table, it was a board meeting. I mean, anything that her brothers and she were going to ever inherit from their parents was on the line now because Doris was getting in deeper. And it reached the point where literally, Meg, you'll remember, of course, because you wrote about it, Meg finally sat down with her mother and me and said, I don't want to know anymore. Don't tell me. But fundamentally, the point is that I think that what Danny and Boomi had in common is the right time for her to get out of corporate and to you know take this risk. And as she said, she could always go back. <sighs> So it was, again, I, I listen to them and my eyes get all watery. It's so <laughs> nice and romantic and wonderful and compatible. We, we didn't have that. We had the romance, but not in the business. 
The other thing that I wanted to mention, and this is something that Danny and Boomy did not touch on that I think is really important, is that the kind of sensitivities and dynamics that exist, that sort of delicate hydraulics that exist in an emotional relationship, in a marriage, and, you know, at least in our case. Now, I know people, we have friends who are entrepreneurs, who are couples, and they can work it out. They can scream at each other during business meetings and vehemently disagree. And then, you know, walk in their door at home and be, you know, pussycats. And I have to say, I found that emotional dynamics of the office, especially because there was no separation, really difficult. Like Gary was my boss. And so he would say, you know, do da 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 da. You know, he'd be sort of brusque in a business like way, not mean, but just sort of brusque, efficient. And I just would take immediate offense, like, don't talk to me that way, you know, be nice. And so that was really hard for me to take. And like I say, I, there are couples who can do that, but I would advise people to be really wary about the sensitivities that exist, those sort of a lot of those kind of meta messages that go on between couples with expression, tone of voice, body language, all that kind of stuff that really gets dispensed with in the workplace because you're just trying to get something done. And you have to be able to make that transition, to ask people to behave, entrepreneurs to behave all sweetie gooey in the workplace is just not realistic. So you you have to be able to make those transitions. And, And I just couldn't personally. That was one reason why we mutually decided that the marriage was working, but the business relationship was not. Again, I go back to Danny and Boomy. I mean, I think what they had in terms of your last point, Maggie, is that there was a mutuality of respect for what each other brought to the table. For example, I mean, I knew, I mean, you were not just a pair of hands. I need to say to break through with an expensive, value-added, organic, better for you, better for the planet yogurt needed a quality consciousness that was not normal in the world. And you had that. You were someone who really brought great quality and care. And that's why you would have been an ideal yogurt maker, but (laughs) it wasn't your thing. And it was moving fast. And a lot of it was illogical and you needed the logic. Can I also quickly say, I mean, we've referenced your book. I I just want to underscore this for the listeners. Maggie's book is called For Better or For Work, A Survival Guide for Entrepreneurs and Their Families. And it's the book we wish we had had. And so if you're in this situation where what Danny and Boomy are talking about, I cannot recommend this book too highly. Maggie was a a writer for Inc. Magazine and was interviewing hundreds and hundreds of couples and helped us to realize we were not alone, but also looked at the whole spectrum of, you know, we're talking about comparing and contrasting two couples here, but you had hundreds that were your database. Yeah. So I worked for the company and directly for Gary for about two years before we both realized this just was not working, especially in the context of a company that was losing money, that was losing my family's money. And I know at one point, Danny and Boomy talked about getting to see each other at work and and seeing those sort of qualities in each other. And actually later, I really did enjoy going to board meetings and watching Gary in that context, in that professional context, because he just handled them all so beautifully. And I learned I learned a lot that way. That ended up being my avenue into what was going on in the business. But before that, for those nine years that we were losing money, the stress on me was so great because as Gary said earlier, I was the passenger. As a matter of fact, the first feature I wrote for Inc. before I started writing my column for them, they very aptly titled Hitched to Someone Else's Dream. And it was published in the Inc. 500. I think this was in 2008. It was published in the Inc. 500 issue. And they got, at the time, uh, the editor-in-chief called me afterwards and said that they got more letters about my feature than they had ever gotten about anything to that point. I don't, I'm sure it's been exceeded since. But it just speaks to how deeply felt these issues are in an entrepreneurial marriage and how little they are addressed. And that's one reason why I wrote my book. And it's one reason why I'm glad that Danny and Boomy are doing this podcast. But the other thing that we haven't said, and I'd like to say here is that the business is a member of the family. It's a living thing. 
And Meg, you just made me think of this. What's that, Princess Diana, that tragic line, you know, it got a bit crowded in this marriage, right, with three of us. I mean, that is what's going on. There's at least three in any couple. The business has its own life. It has its own demands. It has its own call on your time and your consciousness. And you have to think of it that way. (laughs) And hopefully, you know, a menage a trois is going to work for you. But it's, of course, likely that it isn't, certainly on every issue. I think it's the best way to get your head around it. It's not this like, especially if it's truly entrepreneurial, it's not like this thing that you start up in the morning and turn off at night. It's got its own living, breathing, very demanding, whiny, squeaky wheel kind of reality. Yeah. And I'd like to add to that. I think that a shared sense of mission, at least in our case, was really important in keeping us together and keeping the whole scene together. I mean, if we had been making, you know, widgets or chips or something, I think it would have added a whole different kind of stress. I mean, I didn't support the business because of all the financial challenges, but I really supported the product and the mission. So I believed in what Gary was doing. And fast forward into our current lives, we're both now in our mid-60s. And thanks to the success of this mission and this company, we've been able to turn to more charitable reflections of that. So Gary's got his Entrepreneurship Institute that he does is really to benefit startup and uh, mid-sized companies. And I've had cancer three times and I started a program for cancer survivors that has is lifestyle transformation, basically teaching people how to live healthier lives that can reduce their risk of cancer, cancer recurrence, or chronic illness. And so these efforts of ours are really further manifestations of an original mission that we really shared about healthier planet, healthier people. So I guess that's it. Yeah, I guess so. Thank you so much for listening to For Better or For Work. I'm Meg Hirschberg. And for my part, to learn more about my book, For Better or For Work, head on over to Amazon. It's still for sale. And to learn about my anti-cancer lifestyle program, please come see us at anticancerlifestyle.org. That's just one word, anticancerlifestyle.org. And I'm Gary Hirschberg. And you can find out more about my work over at Hirschberg Institute. Dot com. That's H-I-R-S-H-B-E-R-G institute.com. For Better or for Work is part of the Miracy FM podcast network. This episode was produced by Cynthia Lamb. Jeff Govertson and Mishi Lance put it together. Danny Eney is the executive producer. Post-production by Post Office Sound. If you like the show, please follow us and leave a starred review. It really helps to spread the word. Thanks for tuning in.